Backwards Moon, Chapter 2. Nettle and Bracken followed a stream, silver in the fading light. It flowed through thickets of willow bushes, then dropped to the clear pools where the two of them often swam. Lower still, the stream widened to a river that wound in broad bends across the valley floor. When they came to Five Herons Marsh, they turned due east. Then they slowed their brooms and skimmed above the forest. It was dark now, but with their night seeing, Nettle and Bracken could make out an open spot just ahead. They glided low over pumpkin vines and rows of corn. In the daylight, the corn stalks would be tawny and the pumpkins golden, but now they looked gray, yet clear in every detail, the way things did with night seeing. In another moment, Nettle could make out stone roofs, cone-shaped like witches' hats, here and he there among the oak branches. Crooked chimneys and many paned gable windows glinted palely in the starlight. Nettle and Bracken landed on the small, circular clearing that was the village commons and swung off their broomsticks. The scent of wood smoke lingered pleasantly in the air. From a front porch, a distant banjo twanged, clear and merry, mixing with the faint murmur of old voices and high, cracked laughter. Nettle and Bracken ran lightly across the commons and up their own front steps. No light shone inside which meant that their great aunt Irish was out on somebody else's porch. Their aunt, who loved them dearly but tended to forget things, would be home when she thought of it. Nettle and Bracken pushed open the door. A pot of lentil stew, now cold, sat on the back of the stove. Still, Nettle liked lentils, and it wouldn't take long to warm them up. She piled wood and kindling, lit them with a spark from her finger, and shut the stove door with a clang. Bracken put on the kettle for metal mint tea and lit the lantern that hung above the table. It made a warm golden light much cheerier than gray night scene. Nettle ate her supper quickly, thinking about which aspen grove they should go to the next day and how to choose the right sapling with just the right springiness. She imagined the biggest rock they could fling and the clatter and boom it would make as it bounced crazily down the slopes. Catapult was a fun, fine game. They washed the dishes, it was too bad that Magic wouldn't stoop to bother some everyday tasks, and set them back in the cupboard. Netta went out on the porch to toss the dishwater out, whoosh, and stood for a moment. Above her, untold numbers of stars glittered among the oak's crooked branches. The cat's highway arced through them, a starry path that seemed to come from and go to the world on the other side of the mountains. As she often did, Netta imagined herself flying along it. Then she went inside her bare feet padding softly on the wooden floor, and climbed the ladder to the sleeping loft she shared with her cousin. Bracken was already in bed, reading the Cyclopedia of World History by the light of a single candle. It was the only human-made book in the entire village. Bracken had read it over and over. Nettle had read it too, though only once. She'd studied all the pictures. Where are you now? Nettle asked as she hung her hat on the bedpost. The part where they invent the steam locomotive and the telegraph, said Bracken. So she was nearly at the end. Nettle stepped out of her dress and left it lying on the floor. You're not going to brush your hair, said Bracken without looking up. No, said Nettle and slipped into bed. She waited while Bracken read the last few pages of the book, which were all about onward and upward and the bright future of mankind from this glorious day forward. Bracken closed the book and stared into the distance, picking absently at the blanket on her lap. Nettle could tell from her troubled look that Bracken was thinking about their parents and where they had gone. Nettles and Bracken's fathers, like all witches' fathers, were wood folk. When a wood folk man and a witch got married, their children were always tiny witches with dark violet blue eyes and spiky black hair. But long ago, when Nettle and Bracken were only babies, their fathers had vanished along with the entire wood folk tribe. Their mothers had gone looking for them, and then they too had vanished. And ever since, no one would ever talk about it. I don't think humans had anything to do with why our parents are gone, said Nettle now. Bracken didn't say anything. Humans have no magic, said Nettle. Bracken shrugged. Bracken, they can't even see us. Human children can, said Bracken. They can't be all that dangerous, said Nettle. And what about witch friends? Witch friends were special humans who, even when they were grown up, could see witches. There's no need to be afraid of them, obviously. Then why do we live so far away from the human world? Asked Bracken as she had a hundred times before. If humans are harmless, where would Rose and Scabosia and the rest of all the trouble of s go to all the rest of the trouble of spell spinning a veil across the past to keep them out? I think it's to keep us in, said Nettle, because it was true. Whenever they flew too close to the past that led to the outside world, their broomsticks turned around of their own accord. But why? asked Bracken. 
It was no use asking. Rose, who was sort of the leader of the village, but not really, since witches didn't believe in having leaders, would only gaze at you with her deep, old eyes and say there was no telling what the humans were up to these days, and she, for one, didn't want to find out. Nobody else would change the subject, and that would be that. It was obvious that the older witches had decided not to answer certain questions. Perhaps they'd done it late at night, all sitting around the gathering fire, in accordance with the ancient tradition of witch decision-making, though in practice this always led to a lot of time-consuming arguing. So maybe it was just something Rose or Scabiosa had decided and the rest went along with, as often happened. But in any case, it came out to the same thing. It was no use asking. I think we should ask the wolves, said Bracken. They've been through the past lots of times. They must know about humans. Yes, said Nettle, setting up. And at that very moment, a wolf howled. Far away in the night, a second wolf answered. A chorus of yips and barks rose, then faded away. See, said Bracken, it's an omen. And maybe it was, though not the way they thought.